you're here tonight, um, and I'm not supposed to embarrass my colleague, but uh, we have a, a lovely Cunningham, well, it's not the Cunningham family, what is it? It's the Wagner, the Wagner family, um, who are Shaler residents, uh, one of whom still works here as a librarian. Susan was a page. I understand the brother also worked here at one time. So um, since Susan was in town, I felt it was only right that we get her for the program. She was kind enough to say yes. So we've never met before this, even though I work with her sister. So um, we're very excited. If you read any of the PR material, um, I'll just read a little bit of here. So right now you are the Consul General of the U.S. Consulate in Toronto. Just finished. We just finished But it. I still have the title for okay. another week until the new guy gets it. Okay. <laughs> so yes, it's still legal. Yes. She's also held positions in Australia, Ecuador, Haiti, Mauritius, Mauritius yeah. South Africa, and Canada. So we have some books in the back of all those places, so you can ask her about all those places. Um, and I think I'm going to let you talk about your duties and jobs rather than do it. But she was a library page. Now she's in the State Department, so it's a possible career path. I'm sure she'd be happy to uh, share that with you. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth, and, and to the North Taylor North Hills Library for the invitation to speak with you all tonight. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, it should be a, a, a good program. I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey from library page to consul general in the State Department. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the countries that I served in and the work that we do in the State Department. And, and then there will be plenty of time for questions and comments at the end. Um, from, so as Beth said, I started here as a library page, which if you don't know what a library page is, basically you shelf books and you, you know, do whatever the librarians tell you to do. So for those in the crowd that, that are from Shaler, I uh, started in the 1970s and this is when Mary Bean was the, the chief librarian. Uh, there were uh, three, four other ladies, uh, Mrs. Gates, Mrs. Cook, Mrs. Verstig, and Mrs. Davies. And, you know, when I think back in, in my career in that time, to, to have worked in my very first job with five incredibly powerful, intelligent women, really set the stage and I think really helped me along the lines with leadership and, and working from that perspective. So, very fortunate to have had that opportunity and uh, do that work as a library, in the library. And as Beth said, my brother worked in the library, my sister worked in the library, my parents I think both worked in the library, I think my mom helped with the dusting from time to time, my dad was a carpenter so I'm sure fixed various things, uh, but my sister was the only one that went on to actually get her MLS, so she's the only real librarian but we all you know, count the library as kind of our place as well. Um, let me go to the next. Side. So what do we do when we work for the State Department? So the main thing is that we are providing service to the United States and to the American people. We're working to help and protect American citizens overseas. I'm sure many of you have traveled outside the United States, yes? So what happens if you lose your passport? You go to the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. Consulate and we help you. What if you, hopefully no one has, what if you get imprisoned? We help you with that too. Uh, so from those perspectives, we help the American people as well. In the Foreign Service, we get interesting life experiences. I've served in six different countries. People have served all over the world. And you really have an opportunity to learn more about the world that we live in. The work is incredibly challenging. We get to learn new languages. The State Department has its own language school down in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, I've had the opportunity to learn French and Spanish and a little bit of Haitian Creole along the way, but we teach all languages from the really tough ones like Chinese and Arabic down to the Romance or the easier kind of languages as well. We have the opportunity to experience different cultures and we have a lot of variety and change in our lives. I'm gonna just do this real quick video about the State Department. And I know you thought we were going to say we are Penn State, but it's, you know, we are. We are the State Department tonight. Oh, okay. Sorry. 
It's a wonderful and complex world out there, filled with challenges and opportunities. That's why America's diplomats with the U.S. Department of State are on the job every day representing you. We are advancing America's foreign policy interests by uniting our allies, confronting our adversaries, and protecting our citizens. We advance democracy, human rights, global health, and more. We grow markets that create American jobs. We are America's first federal agency, and we're in 190 countries and over 270 U.S. embassies and consulates serving you. We are the United States Department of State. Because from my perspective, my journey from library page to ultimately diplomat started with a book. This book, in fact, which I've kept all these years from the 1970s. It was a book from this library. It was written in the 1950s, or 1960s. And in the 1970s, when I worked here, I got it for 25 cents because it was a discard. Uh, but. It was an opportunity for the first time to really learn a little bit about what the State Department was all about. The state, as noted, the State Department was the first federal agency, and its, its role uh, is to protect and promote U.S. security, prosperity, and democratic values, and shape an international environment in which all Americans can thrive. So having the opportunity to learn a little bit about what a potential career might look like I then tried to follow this kind of steps, and this we're going to talk a little bit about. So at the high school, I was at the Taylor High School next door when it was the high school, and uh, continued my education in languages. I did French. Ultimately, as I mentioned, I learned Spanish, but there's an opportunity there. And in high school, I'm very delighted that one of my former professors from Taylor High School, Al Heinricher, is here with us this evening. He, was, uh, he taught one of the classes in American history and we did a whole section on the best and the brightest. We read the book about the Kennedy years and talking about the Foreign Service. And he pointed out to me that there was a program at one of the local universities that summer of my sophomore year that was like a one-week program, that's like a day camp type of thing, on international affairs. And, well, there was a fee, of course. And he said, well, you know, you can check around, see whatever. I don't know if anybody's here from Rotary, but everybody knows Rotary. So I worked again with another pillar of the Shaler community, Dr. Bittner, who's recently passed away, and he promoted my case to the, the Rotary Club and provided the funding that I could go to this program. And so that was another piece in the puzzle of sort of figuring out what was this international life all about. And if you'll remember, for those of many people here are from Pittsburgh, you know, back in the 70s, 
Pittsburgh was a, you know, a thriving international city. And I think at the time, only New York and Chicago had more international headquarters of companies than Pittsburgh. And, there, and Pittsburgh was number three. So that was also kind of, you know, like back in your mind because there was a lot going on in that space. So then I was, you know, looking as to where I was going to go to university, and I'm delighted that there's some high school students here this evening. And after I had done that program in my in my sophomore year, and uh, after the history class and and the program, so in my junior year I was looking at universities. My one of my cousins was at Penn State in veterinary medicine, so we went up to visit. Little did I know that Penn State had a foreign service degree. They actually called it that, which they changed it now. I think it's more international politics, but. I thought, okay, well, this is where I need to go. So I ended up going to Penn State, and while I was there, had the opportunity to do a study abroad in France, had the opportunity to work a lot with the international students as a volunteer in a lot of universities. Uh, of course, there are lots of international students, probably even many more these days than there were back then, but an opportunity to work with international, international students, help them with English, whatever that might be, uh, sort of keeping your hand in. And then that the, the, the summer between my junior and senior year had the opportunity to do another internship. Uh, and this was with Global Pittsburgh. And our executive director for Global Pittsburgh is here. So anybody that's interested in that space, you're welcome to talk with, uh, with, with her afterwards. And there's some flyers in the back. So Global Pittsburgh is downtown, or located downtown. And it is a volunteer, mostly volunteer organization. The State Department helps these programs around the country. And they are dedicated to international exchange. So they run a, a whole host of programs on international exchange. People from the public are welcome to join. There's opportunities if you'd like to host an international visitor at your home for dinner, or take them to a ball game, or go to a cocktail, you know, like a drinks or whatever they might have. All of these opportunities, and they're for all ages of people. So working there, again, was another piece in that whole puzzle of this, this international work could really be a, a, you know, a, a, an actual career. So after I graduated um, from Penn State, as I was graduating, I took the Foreign Service Officer Test. So the Foreign Service Officer Test, FSOT, is the, it's like the SATs for the Foreign Service. They're, it's kind of like if you know, well, there's a lot of young people in the room, so maybe not, the, the game Trivial Pursuit, or kind of like Jeopardy, maybe. Uh, there's just questions in a whole lot of areas. Because within the Foreign Service, we have five dedicated career tracks. We have people who work in management, in public diplomacy, that's the area that I worked in, I continue to work in. We have people in economic, political affairs, and in consular affairs. So you can imagine there are a lot of different questions on different things about the United States. And then there's a whole section on English grammar because, well, we're representing the United States, we better know how to speak our language and present in a proper way. So I had taken the exam, but you have to wait for a while for the test. And so you, you know, you took the written, had the oral, then you have an oral exam, there's a one day exam you get called, or you can come to Washington DC uh, for that, and I was waiting on my security clearance, et cetera, et cetera, and ended up getting a job with a member of Congress from Texas of all places, but that's how Washington is, I guess, sometimes. And I think from my perspective, it actually was a perfect segue into uh, the Foreign Service because working for the legislative branch, I really got to see how the legislators, how congressmen, how congresswomen, how senators work for the American people. Because as I mentioned before, that's one of the things that we do overseas as well. And definitely during the course of my career, I've met many members of Congress who've come visiting to the, in the various countries that I've served in. And also to and, and also to help them because again, you know, you're an American in distress. You're an American that I don't know needs a passport, and we know there's a big delay. So maybe you write to your member of Congress, and then they reach out to the State Department, and then we have to answer the mail and get that sorted out for people. Or somebody that you know is a is, has a fiance from a foreign country. It takes a long time to get those visas. So again, you might reach out to your member of Congress. And again, the State Department officers have to respond to that and try to resolve the issue. So then eventually I passed the Foreign Service exam, so that was great, and had the opportunity to serve in a number of countries. So I think as you saw in the, in the uh, flyer, I started out in South Africa. This was during apartheid uh, in the 1980s uh, in Pretoria and then Johannesburg. 
and then in so South Africa here. Mauritius, you can't see the red, but a small little country in the middle of the Indian Ocean. <coughs> then I had the opportunity to go to Haiti, always in the news, Ecuador, to Australia, and then to Canada. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about some of the, just a little snippet of something I did during that time, so you can get a sense of what foreign service officers do uh, overseas. So in Australia, um, I was in Australia just after 9-11, so I got there in 2002 to 2006. And if you remember back to those days, the US, Australia, and uh, the UK had a tripartite to work on issues in Afghanistan and then eventually in Iraq. And so there was a lot going on in that space. The US and Australia have a very strong relationship that dates back uh, you know, to during World War II. Uh, and a lot of the work that we did there, as I mentioned, I work in the public diplomacy space. So a lot of the work that we were doing there in those couple of years was really the strategic communications piece of the work. Uh, definitely at the embassy, we were you know, very involved with what was going on Post 9/11, we were doing, working with you know the Australian people, trying to explain what the U.S. was doing, why we were doing these things, and how we worked together with the two, with the, between the two countries. And if you think back to World War II, there was a major battle, the Battle of the Coral Sea, where the U.S. helped Australia, and and people say that if the U.S. hadn't been there, Australia might have become Japanese, frankly. And so from the, it's the relationship between our two countries is very strong allies. Again, it's so important what we do in the State Department to keep maintaining those relationships. We can't always, we can't always guarantee that even though we have a strong relationship with a country for years and years and years, like the UK, like Australia, that, that that can't change. So we need to be present. We need to be in the community, out in the public. As I mentioned um, that I'm a public diplomacy officer, and there was a, a gentleman, Edward R. Murrow, who was a journalist, he was on TV uh, many years ago, and one of the things that he was very well known for saying is that you have to be thinking about the last three feet. You know, you can tell people all of these wonderful things, but it's really that people-to-people -people link, that really that personal contact, one person at a time, as you describe, as you talk about whatever the issues are, and so really, Starting in, uh, in Australia, that was really a big piece, that person-to-person, -person, how we were talking about the relationship, how we were building the security relationship, how are we looking at the, the world in a, in a post-9-11 uh, atmosphere. In Quito, Ecuador. So Ecuador was my only Spanish-speaking post. I wish I had gone to more, but in the Foreign Service, you basically don't really get a big choice of where you're going to go. You can put your, a list of places you might want to go, and then they pick one for you. So you hope you get some of the ones that were on your list anyway. But Ecuador was, was a fascinating country. And, and for those of you who have traveled to Latin America um, in, those, in those days, and I think it's, it's gotten a bit better, but there was a lot of leftist and anti-American sentiment. And I was working up the Central University uh, on some of our exchange programs. You may know the Fulbright program, which the State Department runs. It's our preeminent academic exchange program. And we, the Fulbright director and I were talking with the president of the university, who, while a very nice man, was clearly not very pro-American. In fact, I could say he was anti-American. And uh, we were talking about, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a Fulbrighter at the Central University, a major, major university in Quito. And, you know, there. He was maybe a little bit interested. Some of his staff were actually quite interested. And so we were probing a little bit more again that last three feet. Turns out that the gentleman was very interested in music. So we said, oh, well, maybe we could find a Fulbrighter in the field of music. So we brought a Fulbrighter uh, from Oregon, Oregon State University, and he came for a semester and he worked on music and, and, and uh, talked about you know, American trends in music, American jazz, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of his time, he brought a group of his students, his choral students, to the university um, in, in Quito. And he had his students, along with students at the university who were in the choral program, 
learn a song that was a very well-known piece in Ecuador. And they did a wonderful program at the end of his time. The students together sang in Spanish and Quechua um, this song. And you know what? Changed the mind of the university president. And he said, if that's what Fulbright can do, give me more. So you never know, right, how that last three feet is going to make it. So South Africa was my first posting uh, in, as I mentioned, in the 1980s. And it was during apartheid, very difficult, but very exciting time. A lot of the work that we were doing in the public diplomacy area was in the townships, and the black townships, and particularly in Soweto, being in the largest uh, black township in the Johannesburg area. And we decided at the embassy and the consulate there in Johannesburg that we wanted to set up an American library. Again, information, opportunity, etc. So we had the opportunity to get a, a space uh, in, in Soweto that was a library. It was run by the, the YMCA, I think. Uh, and we took it over, and my job was to get it ready. So it was a combination of you know, security work, fixing up various things. Okay, I wasn't doing this hammering and that, but you know, working with the contractors, etc., getting the library um, comes back to that library stuff always again. Um, but you know, the library furniture, the books, the everything that was setting up there. At the same time, uh, we were running for the very first time. In the, in the 1980s, was a, we had youth exchange programs, which we still have to this day, but it was an opportunity to send some high school students from South Africa. And we specifically sent people from the black communities. And so there was a, a young man who had gone, I think he was just out of high school, or maybe in early years of, of post high school years, and he was sent uh, to a, a camp, uh, as camp counselor in Maine, I think it was, and he was telling me when he came back, you know, at the end of the camp opportunity, he was able to share South African culture, South African black dance, et cetera. It was, a, you know, a wonderful experience for him and for the students. They got to go on a one-week uh, bus tour down to Washington, D.C. And, of course, to get from northeast down, of course, you go through Pennsylvania. And the instructor, the, 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 I guess the chaperone, was explaining in the United States that, oh, you know, in various states you've got these different license plates and this is what they mean. And in Pennsylvania at the time, the license plate was, you've got a friend in Pennsylvania. So she's explaining this and he says to her, hello, I already have a friend in Pennsylvania because I was the one that sent him on the exchange program, right? And so it was so wonderful to hear that, you know, when he came back. And then, small world that it is, about 10 years later, um, we hired him as the librarian in that library, in the Rosa Parks Library, and he's still there today. I had the chance about 10 years ago to go to South Africa and met him, got the new tour, all of that. So you never know the power of exchange. It changes people's lives, and it gives them the opportunity to change others' lives for the better. In Haiti, so Haiti was, I would say, definitely the most difficult place that I served, but interestingly enough, it was the only country that like all of my family came to. So uh, I'm not sure. I had my immediate family came, I had cousins who came, I had um, my late husband's family came, friends from South Africa. I mean, you know, we had all people from all over. But in, in Haiti, um, it was, it, it continues to be a difficult country, of course. But one of the things that we were working on there was in the space of civic education. So we recognize that in de democratic countries, we, I think we also take civics. I don't know if the students take civics these days. No, but you should be. Uh, <laughs> it's not called civics. It's not called civics. It's very OK, but it was back in the day, civics and civic education. And so we worked uh, with the, the, the Georgetown Law School and developed like a, a picture book, a, a comic book, I guess, really, it was on civic education, on one's rights and responsibilities. And then the USAID, you saw them in the, in, the, in the video, then took that as part of their education programs that they were working on in the country. So it was an opportunity for young people. Uh, we were able to provide the materials, and then USAID folks were able to teach the teachers how to teach the program. 
and it gave young people an opportunity to both see what their rights were, but also what their responsibilities were. And so again, as we look at shared values of the United States with the various countries, we look for opportunities to make that difference. Port Louis Mauritius, tiny little island in the, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, fabulous place, uh, beautiful, really far away from everywhere. Uh, but interestingly enough, um, during the time that I was there, uh, we, we were celebrating 200 years of trade with Mauritius. You'd think, like, what the heck, right? But back in the day, that was a big trading route uh, in the Indian Ocean. And I had the opportunity with various colleagues, both Fulbrighters, other exchange participants, people who knew the U.S.-Mauritius relationship, and we had an opportunity to do a one-week program about the relationship, and then we took that, another book, uh, into a book on U.S.-Mauritius relations, 200 years of trade, history, and culture. And I was just, I, I had a call the other day, you never know, um, you know how you connect with people somewhere along the way, but a, a gentleman who uh, was, was one of the people that wrote in the book, and through various people, we've kind of stayed in touch a little bit, and he reached out to me. He's a, he's a professor at Yale University now, and he said he was going to be writing some new book, and he was taking some, a bit of the, of the paragraph, of the, of the article that he had written in this, and he wanted to let me know. And you know, so you just, again, what, the, what, the, what you do today, you never know how that's going to play out tomorrow. And then finally, uh, I served in Canada. So, um, like many Pittsburghers, um, that the first time I ever left my country was in Niagara Falls in Toronto. I always told my team up there, you know, I was destined to come to Canada. And they were like, doesn't everybody go to Niagara Falls? Anyway, true, <laughs> but um, so I served in Ottawa 10 years ago and then had the opportunity to go back to Toronto where I served as Consul General. And I think for me, um, part of the reason that um, I, I never really thought about Canada, not because I thought it was just like the United States, because it's not, um, but I just, it wasn't ever really on my radar. And, and I used to say, you know, to people, oh yeah, like, you know, you're not really going overseas, you're going over a couple of big lakes, which are kind of like seas. Uh, but uh, my time in Ottawa was uh, in 2010 to 2013, and there was a, a, a big resurgence Again, you know, 10 years after 9-11, what was going on on security and trade issues? Um, in Canada and the United States, it's a, you know, every day, you know, $265 billion in goods and services cross that border, right? It's a huge relationship. It's our biggest trading partner. It's the state of Pennsylvania's biggest trading partner and 29 other states. So there's a lot going on in that space. And, but again, many years ago, we have a long border, it's an undefended border, we really are the envy of the world and, and the fact that we've got this wonderful relationship between our two countries. But the fact is that, you know, back when many people were growing up back in the day, you know, people might have had their baby at a hospital across the border. We didn't really know where the border was, I and mean, you knew it, but there was no real border crossing. Uh, people would, you know, ride their bike across the border, the border, and just have lunch for the day or take the, a boat across, whatever it might be. But we realized that in the wake of 9-11 and trying to figure out all the security pieces, that we really had to strengthen that border. And it was a difficult sell in, that, in many respects because people were so used to going across that border that was so easy to get across. And now we were making it, we in the United States were making it more difficult. But we were looking, in, again, in, the, in our public affairs and public diplomacy, uh, we were working on some remarks from President Obama, who was going to be giving, uh, the, you know, the talking about the beyond the border work that we were doing between our two countries. And we drafted up some language that said, well, you know, really trade and security are different sides of the same coin. You know, you can have one and the other, that's not an and or type of thing. And lo and behold, we were watching the president that day, because they, that was in Washington, D.C., and he used our language. So you're like, you can't do much better than that. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. Uh, but when I had the opportunity to go back to Toronto, or go to Toronto, part of the reason was that I felt that um, in, during my time in Canada, I learned more about the United States than I ever really expected. And I'll give you one example. Um, 
when I was there, it was the bicentennial of the War of 1812. So the War of 1812 was one of those wars we don't talk a lot about in Canada because we kind of have differing views on who won the war. But in any case, um, it turns out that there was uh, there are some military detailees from our U.S. military who served in various places around the country. And some years ago, a naval officer in Halifax, which is out on the East Coast, uh, came across some records showing that there had been a couple hundred sailors and seamen who had died during the War of 1812. They weren't shot to death or whatever. I think they died of disease. But in any case, they were buried in a mass grave in Halifax City, right, to, right in the city, in basically like a little park uh, in this mass grave. And so he worked with the city and they put up a wonderful plaque. And ever since that, for the last, I don't know how many years, 15, 20 years, in Canada, they do a commemoration for our Memorial Day. And I thought to me, oh, wow. you know, you never expect that kind of, even with a wonderful ally like Canada, how to expect that a, another country would commemorate your war day <coughs> was really, really gratifying and really important from my perspective. And I learned as well, so during that 200th anniversary, we got a note that the Daughters of the War of 1812 were coming. Well, okay, we've all heard of the Daughters of the American Revolution, I think. Uh, but I never heard of the Daughters of the War of 1812, or the Granddaughters of the War of the American Revolution. So a group of women, some of a certain age, with their white gloves and their sashes on, came to put their own plaque at the entrance to this lovely park commemorating the U.S. war dead. So quite a fascinating time. And so when I had the opportunity to get the job in Toronto, I thought, well, why not? There's so much more that we can do to reinforce the relationship with this wonderful ally that I thought, well, I will go back. So a couple of things in Toronto. Um, we work as, as the Consul General, I was responsible for the province of Ontario. So we already talked a little bit about how much of a powerhouse it is in the economic space. And so during my time there, we had the opportunity to do a number of different things. We had the opportunity to promote U.S. trade with our Select USA. So this is where we have an opportunity to bring companies lots of startups, various companies from Canada to the United States to look for opportunities. And a really great example uh, is a company that does Indian sweets and, and savories. They wanted to expand their production. They came to the United States, they toured around, they ended up putting a distribution plant in Springfield, Ohio. And in October, they're gonna be inaugurating that and they're gonna be making more of these foods for our market here in the United States. So really interesting opportunities like that. Another trade related opportunity, kind of I guess a little bit in the technology space and not sure related to American food products, but they we had an opportunity to travel up to London, Ontario, which is a couple hours from Toronto, to a cricket farm. So I talked with the mayor and he's like, oh, do you like crickets? And I'm like, well, I don't know, I like them as much as anybody else. He said, I don't eat them. And I said, well, I don't think so. But I was quite taken with this story. So there were a, a, a young a group of young people from the university, actually in Montreal, at McGill, and they won a million dollar prize to work on food security. So they worked in Houston, Texas, and they developed the R&D, and they figured out how how they would raise crickets. And then ultimately, they opened up the factory in London, Ontario. We got to go and see it, quite fascinating. No, it's not as loud as you might think it is, because since there's no females, the males aren't making a lot of noise. Uh, but they are making, they're, they're growing crickets, and they're putting those in pet food, which is being sold in the United States, because the high protein for animals, particularly cats, but for, for dogs and cats, so again, these sort of unusual relationships between our two countries. We had the opportunity here, I'm standing there with the um, Japanese Consul General. There was the International Hockey Federation competition for women, and the US was playing uh, Japan, and we got to promote, to present these um, uh, hockey sticks that were designed by the indigenous uh, women in Canada. Had the opportunity to go up to NORAD, which is the North American Airspace Defense Command, which is up in North Bay, 
They're the people that basically track the spy balloons that were coming across. They, 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 they uh, watch the Arctic for mostly Russian planes, and they also track Santa. Uh, but I had an opportunity, because it's a U.S., it's a joint U.S. Canada command. And then up at the top, had the opportunity to go into a, a mine uh, about uh, two kilometers, so 1.6 miles below the surface. It's the largest clean mine in the world, and what they're doing, what you say clean, it, it is an old mine, uh, which they're not using anymore for a mine. They, they mine nickel up there. But the program there, they are looking into deep space. And because it's well below ground, there's the side lens that's not you know, affected by anything that's bad. And so they can do this really interesting work. They work with our Department of Energy. A number of US universities have experiments going on up there. We have the opportunity to do that. So there's lots of opportunities to sort of, that's just sort of a bit of a sampling of some of the programs that we did. Uh, and then just my, my final slide is a little bit about some of our exchange programs. And there are two that I wanted to highlight. Um, oh, here, just, we have the US Army Jazz Band came up for our 4th of July event, so that was kind of fun. And, uh, but we have a lot of international programs for people from a lot of ages. And the Youth Ambassadors Program was one that's now in its 10th year. We, we, we created it when I was in Ottawa, and again, had the opportunity to come back. And it's for high school students who are first generation Canadians. Again, getting back to the point uh, with you know any of our allies, we can't necessarily say that every, that we're gonna have this wonderful relationship for the rest, relationship for the rest of our lives. So how do we get at that? We can look through exchange programs as one tool. And for the youth ambassadors, we were sending about 20 students uh, a year for the last 10 years. They were all new Canadians or First Nations, Métis, uh, Indigenous Canadians. And I had the opportunity last uh, earlier this year to meet one of those students who was on our initial year. She is now a psychiatrist in the Métis community up in North Bay, where Norad is. And she said, you know, not only is she still in touch with the people in her cohort that she went, the other Canadians, but the American students that they met with, they were at uh, SUNY Plattsburgh for that part of the exchange. Uh, and also, each of the students was uh, had to do a community service project in their high school, and she's still involved with that 10 years later. So really, these the powerfulness of exchange programs and how we can work through all of those types of things. Um, I would just say, you know, one other piece which isn't recognized, which isn't here, but I wanted to say, uh, one of the things that we did when I was in Toronto is looking at our shared history. You know, I think as Americans, we all know what the Underground Railroad is, right? But I, for one, never really thought about, well, where did all those freedom seekers end up? Well, they ended up in Canada, and they ended up in Niagara Falls, in St. Catharines, they ended up in Windsor, Ontario, and up through there. And we did a lot of outreach in those areas. We had the opportunity to go to Harriet Tubman's Chapel in St. Catharines and talk to the families there that are still descendants of those initial American, original American freedom seekers. And in my last week in the country, had the opportunity to go to a cemetery in Toronto and there was a gentleman there uh, who was buried there by the name of William Thornton. He and his wife escaped from the United States, came up through Windsor, uh, through a very complicated um, use of the Underground Railroad, and ended up in Toronto in the, in the, you know, during the you know, Civil War years. And they started the first taxi service in Toronto called the City. And when the gentleman died, he bequeathed $18,000 to his wife, which I thought was pretty impressive for someone who started out as a slave at the age of three in Kentucky, I think, and then made his way up and then lived in Toronto, lived out his years there. And the saying goes, I kind of like it, so I'm going to say it's true, but we'll see. Um, the, the colors of the city taxi were yellow and red. And when the Toronto Metro, which is called the TTC, was started, they took the red because the, the city taxi was so ubiquitous about transportation that they thought they would take that same color for the, the metro system there. Um, 
But I think from that perspective, we have an opportunity to see our shared history and what's going on between our two countries. So from, from Canada, from going to a country that I never really thought about going, it was a very consequential assignment. So I hope with this that um, hopefully I've reached the, that last three feet with all of you and had a chance to tell a little bit about my story, but a little bit about the State Department. Uh, I do have at the end, but we'll have, I can talk with people afterwards as well, of the various ways to get more information about the, the, about the State Department. And for the young people in the room, I would note as well, um, we also have what they call a diplomat in residence, uh, who is based um, loosely out of the University of Pittsburgh, but she is a recruiter for the State Department, whether it's foreign service or civil service, also about our various um, internships, etc. And I'd be happy to uh, connect people with her. She's just, just started her job uh, a couple weeks back and would be a great resource for people. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Q&A. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, how long do you spend at each? Oh, good question. Um, it's usually the State Department standard is three years, but depending on the country, it can sometimes be fewer. So if you're going to a very tough place like Pakistan or Haiti, it could be a year or two. Uh, and then in some cases, you do have the opportunity to request a fourth year, and that might be in places that are medium difficult, but you're you're comfortable there, you're happy there. Sometimes it's better for your kids to finish, you know, a year in high school, etc. But the standard is three years. Yeah, I think when the State Department shows up in the movies, there's usually something really dramatic going on, and people are you know being airlifted out in helicopters, and everything is very dangerous. Is that Real, or is that not? Part of the <laughs> um, it, it is real. Um, although I've never been anywhere where that happened, but I know people who have. Um, definitely, there are very serious situations. Sometimes it's airlifting people for danger, a war, whatever. But I did, I did experience it in a different way when I was in Washington before going to Toronto. Of course, it was COVID. Well, I talked about all these exchange programs. We probably have ten thousand people around the world, both international students and people here, Americans who are overseas, vice versa, right? We had to bring all those people home. And we had to get all those people home from all over the United States. So it was a different kind of airlift, but it was trying to figure this out. And how did you get how do you get a kid from Des Moines, Iowa to, you know, I don't know, Baku, Azerbaijan? Uh, you know, we had to figure out who was there. Could we work with the good thing is that we work with our exchange partnership organizations, and sometimes we had to like rent a not rent I guess rent um, a, a plane to get them home. We had to make sure that these kids, particularly that were going back to countries where you know COVID wasn't maybe managed as well as in some places, that they weren't stuck in you know like sort of a, not a prison but like a COVID quarantine with adults because these are high school kids. So it was a lot of work to figure all of that out. But yes, it does happen. And if you've watched The Diplomat on Netflix, you know, some it talked with a lot of people. And I think sometimes you have to sort of suspend belief in some cases. But a lot of it's very true. Yes. Yeah. Um, I went to high school in the 1970s. And um, we had four exchange students yes. back then. So is that part of were, were you involved with? Yes. So um, do we do that? The State Department? Yes. So we have uh, we have our own high school exchange, but then there are a lot of private exchanges as well. So sometimes, so we, we fund exchange programs, and then there are other programs where uh, students can either, you know, pay their own way or get other funding, et cetera. So yes, we have a, the, uh, the high school exchange is probably about 4,000 students a year, um, and we try to focus on countries that don't have the the easier, they have as much of ability. Like we're not going to probably be bringing people from the UK, but we might be bringing them from Pakistan or Niger or Ghana, whatever it might be. Yes. And then I lived in West Virginia, and when I was there, my neighbor, they were a big. They took in foreign exchange students. Yes. 
and um, Japanese girls. Um, it seemed like they took a lot of Japanese from okay. for a year, and they were nice. They built what, a garden, you know, the yes. girls did. But anyway, it was very interesting. Lovely. I met some Wonderful. their foreign exchange from high school. Yes. I don't know, Nadia, do you sometimes place some we of the do. students? So this is Nadia from Global yes, Pittsburgh. I'm from Global Pittsburgh. We're designated partner of the U.S. State Department uh, to implement those international exchange programs here in uh, Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, and West Virginia as well. They don't have their own their organization. So <clears throat> we work with IVLP uh, with you know, those short-term visits of international leaders, but we also work with uh, high school students and college students who are here in Pittsburgh and if you're ever interested in hosting uh, in your home for several months a semester or just for dinner, international leaders from around the world for dinner, just let me know with some flyers. Sign up. It's <laughs> <laughs> do a great job. It's <laughs> free to sign up. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, just career-wise, yes. so um, do you need to pull off a master's before you take that exam for the you don't even, what you're tracking? You don't even need a college degree to join the Foreign Service. As long as you pass the exam, you do not. I have not met many people that don't have a degree, but I have uh, met a few. I, there was a woman that I knew uh, who we were trying to organize a, a master's program. We have the opportunity sometimes in the State Department to go to the military colleges, yes. and they will let us go, you know, for free of charge, because we send ambassadors to teach them, and then they send, you know, we can get people. And there was a woman, and I was working in HR at the time, and we wanted, she wanted to go, and she said, you know, I never finished my degree. I started, you know, I kind of got kicked out of the house, had to do this, and she found her way to the State Department. She didn't need the, she didn't need the degree to get in. Uh, and in that case, the, the, the military college was willing to um, kind of do her service in lieu of it, so she was able to get her master's. So you don't need one. Um, how about, I would say, though, generally, you know, there's only 14,000 or so foreign service officers. So it's a pretty small, you know, if you look at the military, but it's a small number of people. So it's quite competitive to get in. Uh, but these days, I would say, Maybe always more people would have a master's than not, but there's no requirement. I see. No requirement. Uh, plenty of people pass the exam right out of you know undergrad or maybe a couple of years you know afterwards. Second question. Yes. You talked about the uh, you have your own language, so I didn't know that. Yes. I thought you all went to DLI. Oh no. So where where is that? It's in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, it's called the foreign the uh, the the, um, the Schultz. Foreign Service Institute. Interestingly enough, back in the in World War II, before World War II, it was a girls' school, and so it's on a campus. I mean, it's a, it's a really great space, right? And then during the war, uh, during World War II, the government took it over, and they they had code breakers there. In fact, many women, and then ultimately the State Department bought it. Yeah, and so we have all of our language programs are there. Uh, we do our um, various training, you know, new ambassadors going overseas, uh, tech, all those kinds of things. They're big spaces that we have there. It's a really wonderful campus, uh, and it's a great language school. There you go. Yes. Susan, can you talk a little bit about that terminology? Like, I don't, I can't say I know what a consulate is for ah, an embassy sure. or a consul general, even though I've been promoting it for months. <laughs> like, she's not an ambassador, am I using the right terminology? I just, I don't know if there's a way to... Sure, so in any given country, uh, when the office is at the capital of the country, it's always an embassy. Select number of countries also have consulates. Not everyone has a consulate. Not every country has a consulate. Mostly smaller countries do not have consulates, although sometimes we do. Um, so in Canada, we have our embassy in Ottawa, and that's headed always by the ambassador. Um, ambassadors can be career officers like myself, but ambassadors can also be political appointees. So in Canada, it's usually a political appointee. Our current ambassador is from Philadelphia. I uh, used to be with Comcast and a uh, very good friend of the president's. That usually helps. Uh, and uh, whatever the president is. 
and uh, and then he's been uh, at the embassy there for almost two years now. But the uh, but then in, in usually bigger countries and countries that have a stronger relationship with the United States, kind of have, but, uh, have consulates. So in Canada, for example, we have consulates in Halifax, Quebec City, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, although there's only one person there, but it's very tiny, uh, Calgary, and Vancouver. So we have a lot. Now Canada, in return, has probably double that number of consulates in the United States. Of course, we're a much bigger country, right, from that perspective. So the consul general is the person that runs the consulate. So while I do, you know, report to the ambassador and what they call the deputy chief of mission, who's the number two, um, basically you kind of have a choice to kind of do what you want to do. Uh, they never really, you know, second guessed me. Uh, I wasn't doing anything crazy, uh, I don't think. Uh, but the opportunity to just see what you need to do in your, uh, in your area. Now several of the consulates in Toronto, in Canada, for example, cover different number of, of provinces. But because Ontario is so important, you just have the one person. So the Consul General, I don't know of a Consul General that is a political. Uh, from the United States, we're all career. Other countries, though, do have some political appointees who are Consul General, Consuls General. Uh, and interestingly, in Toronto, um, after New York, it has the highest number of foreign consulates other than New York City. And you kind of thought, oh, that kind of is really kind of interesting. So it's, it was quite a fascinating time to meet, you know, you were going to national days and, you know, they were doing flag raisings and they would come to your events and all that. It was, you, know, you got to meet a lot of interesting people. I have yes. a question. So when you go to all those different locations, yes. do you get some kind of agenda that you have to follow or you just kind of go there and see what they need? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, usually uh, at, the, at the embassy or embassy and consulate, so if you're just at an embassy or embassy and consulate, the, the ambassador will kind of set the, the tone. So in the case of Canada, um, the, usually the, the U.S. president, the newly elected U.S. president, <laughs> almost always goes to Canada first, right? And so while President Biden could not go because of COVID and the border was closed and all of that, he did a virtual meeting and they set a, an agenda, which they called the Roadmap for Renewed U.S.-Canada Partnership. And so that set out these different pillars, you know, fighting against COVID, we were looking at climate change, security and defense, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion and accessibility, uh, building back better. So we were looking at, so we, that, those were sort of our broad range, and then we would determine in each consulate what we would focus on. So for example, in Toronto, you know, we really didn't have a lot of security and defense, a little bit up at NORAD, but you know, we didn't, that was more like an Ottawa thing because of the federal government. But we would focus a lot on the building back better because it's the big economic engine in the country what was going on and you know what happened to all these small businesses, how were we working about it in the United States, how do we make those connections? Yes, sir. Well, there's a change in administration in Washington in your at your post. Yes. Is it very quickly is there a large adaptation because of political change or is this something that evolves over many months when you're on the ground in whatever pick a country. Uh, it, it's usually more over many months because the U.S. Senate does take a fair amount of time to approve ambassadors. So right now there's, I don't know, 100 waiting in the Senate? I mean, it's some ridiculous number, right? They just, they're on hold, they've got all these, right? So when, it, when what happens, you know, the election is in November, uh, and then right away anybody that is an ambassador, whether they are career or political, tender their resignation, because ambassadors work at the pleasure of the president. The rest of us, yes, we, we work you know, for the president and for the State Department, but it's a different relationship, right? But the, the ambassadors are assigned, whether they're career or political. So they tender their resignation, and then the new administration says, you know, yes or no. If it's a change of party, almost always they will accept the resignation. But then, you know, then there'll be someone acting. Usually it'll be a, you know, the number two, until a new ambassador is named. And that can take some time. Because maybe the new, you know, administration hasn't figured out how many who they want to send 
where, then they've got to do all their paperwork, they've got to submit all their paperwork in terms of you know, getting their ethics work and all that done for the Senate to make a decision. So in the meantime, you know, we would definitely get information from the State Department because the Secretary of State would change as well because those are always political. Uh, but we would, you know, kind of muddle along. Yes, sir. What skills are required to become a consulate? To become a consul general? Oh, yes, a consul general. You know, partly it's, you know, you've been in for a while. Right? <laughs> so you've learned things at different jobs. But I think for any of the positions, whether you're starting out, you know, from day one, you know, are you able to, you know, lead people? Are you a good communicator? Do you have, you know, that, that, that idea of service, that public service that we talked about uh, in terms of that? And, you know, and are you sort of a bit of a self-starter? Um, as I mentioned, as at the consul general level, you're, you're in charge. So you need to decide what your team, you work with your team, you, you know, it's not necessarily all you because you never want to be the person that's just, you know, dictating what everybody wants to do because I always say, and I think many people, you know, think the same, you know, so I, I don't have a corner in the market of good ideas because you might have a better idea, you might have a better idea. It would behoove me to listen to you and see what's going on because I might be new in the country, but you've been there for two years. Or in all of our consulates and our embassies, we have what we call local staff. So, you know, we have Canadians that work for us in Canada. We have Haitians that work for us in Haiti. And so these folks really know what it's like for Americans on the ground and what the people of the country, you know, would be interested in, in learning about, hearing about. So I think it's, you know, leadership, it's willing to step up, and but willing to also listen, whether you're listening to your own team or listening to the people that you're interacting with in the country. So what's next for you? So what's next for me? So I'm going back to Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm going to work for one more year. I'm retiring next year. The State Department, uh, like the U.S. military, has a, an upper out system. So uh, at some point, if there's no more you know, promotions you can get, they say thank you very much. And that's okay. I'm ready to retire. I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, but I'm hoping to uh, go back. One of the things that at our Foreign Service Institute that we've uh, instituted over the last couple of years uh, we do a lot of leadership and development and training for the leaders that are coming up, right? Because if we say, oh, you're going to be the Consul General, you might be ready to do it, but you're not really sure of what to do some days. But we have a, a program where we do leadership coaching. And I'm one of the leadership coaches. I do it part-time now, and I'm hoping to, to do that for my last year full-time. Excellent. Uh, you will join me in thanking Susan. We do have a lot of